Um, it worked that time. And that means that I'm just going to wait until this thing loads so I can close this page and then we can officially start doing my favorite thing. Okay, close that. One last time. Once more unto the breach. I don't know why war metaphors. I just, it's, I have spring break on the mind or the fantasy of a spring break that may never arrive. Um, and maybe that also makes me think of like spring and warmth and changing seasons. Uh, and that's all really exciting. And it kind of feels nonsensical. So I'm going to stop that because I want to talk about this instead. Um, welcome to Queer of Color, Trans of Color Conversations. I really, really love this series. I really love this series. I, I'm exceedingly proud of it and the work that it has done and the work that the team, my team, the people that I have the benefit and the opportunity to work with CLAGS have done it have done together and bringing it together. Um, and I maybe just like want to say thank you, but first I want to introduce CLAGS. Uh, and so I think for that, I want to bring on once more this year, uh, our executive director, Matt Brim, to say a bit about CLAGS as an institution. Thank you, James. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to give James a huge round of Zoom applause for organizing and facilitating the Queer of Color, Trans of Color conversations this year. It's what have been our, our, our signature series. Uh, and you've just done a terrific job. And uh, Jose, it's good to meet you and to welcome you today. Uh, I'm Matt Brim. I'm the executive director of CLAGS, the Center for LGBTQ Studies. And it's my pleasure today to greet everybody and say hi, and also to ask for your support. And I do this at many events, and today I'm going to do it a little bit differently. Uh, CLAGS is the, the first research-based center, university-based research center for LGBTQ studies in the United States. And we're very proud of that. And we're proud of our location at CUNY and at the Graduate Center. Um, we ask for your support because we are a public university and we are uh, our mission is to, to offer free, accessible LGBTQ studies to everybody. We're committed to that mission and as a public university uh, we also face some pretty tough financial circumstances and so your support is really important to us um, you can give money to us by going to our donation page we'll drop that chat in the link but there's another way you can help us out this fall we were honored to work with the feminist press to publish two volumes um, one is called queer ideas and the other collection is called queer then and now and these books collect the Kessler Lectures. Kessler Lectures are the, the award lectures given by um, honorees who we are honoring for sustained achievement in LGBTQ scholarship, activism, and art. And these two books, one is Queer Ideas. This is a little postcard, but that's the cover. And the other is Queer Then and Now. Collect 27 Kessler Lectures. Um, and... If you teach a queer studies class or if you're interested in the history of queer studies, these volumes really can um, be used as a, a thorough history of the changing field of LGBTQ studies from the first lecture in 1992 um, all the way up to Rod Ferguson's 2020 lecture. If you order those books from the Feminist Press, our terrific publisher, also housed at the CUNY Graduate Center, uh, and Rod will put those links in the chat. If you order from the Feminist Press as opposed to another online um, platform, you will receive uh, swag. We have CLAGS, how do I do this? CLAGS tote bags. Uh, and so you'll get the book or books if you buy both of them and also this great tote bag. We so much appreciate your support. Uh, the best support you can give us, of course, is your attention and your attendance. And you're here today. Um, and so we thank you so much for that. Again, Jose, uh, thanks so much for being with us. And James, um, thanks for putting the series together. Just want to quickly say uh, thanks so much to our ASL interpreters today as well. Bye. OK. I, I normally this is the part where I want to dive right in, but because it's the last one of the year, I can't because first I have to pause and say a round of thank you. So Jose, bear with me. I'm, I will make it quick. Um, this series is like all the things we do at CLAGS only possible because there's an incredible team. 
Um, and it's a team that's really been just a pleasure to work with. Uh, and so I really want to take a moment and say thank you to my co-chair who wasn't able to be here tonight. But Laura Westengard is just such a joy to work with and to think with um, and to work alongside. Uh, Margo Weiss has been an incredible like asset to us and just like bring some really great people, some really thoughtful people, some really enlightening conversations. Uh, Deborah Biswas has been incredible every step of the way. Uh, and then we have a staff in the office, right? So it's going to be Donna Human, who is just incredible and schedules things in a way that like make them happen. Um, every time I have a question about anything, always I ask Donna first because Donna has every answer. Uh, she is a human encyclopedia and it's shocking to me. Um, Yasmina is our director of finance and is just like, you know, somebody's got to run the money and like know how money works. And that cannot be me. And I'm so grateful that there's someone that we trust and someone who is so completely aligned with our politics and someone who I will just say has worked through a year of like personal real tragedy, right? Yasmina has had a difficult year and has shown up for us in spite of that. Um, and I can't say thank you enough. Uh, Rod Hurley, our ASL, our tech person rather, uh, has been just so like nice to get to know and nice to work with. Uh, we've had promotional staff. We've had sort of, uh, uh, what am I thinking of? What's Christina's job? Uh, scholars and residents, just like the team of people who make the ideas that are this place possible. Um, and I, I, I realize that this series is a lot of people thanking me and I will always take that credit because nothing happens without me. I'm amazing. And also the, the, there it's, it's, just, it, that's not true. There's a team of people who make this happen and they're incredible and thank you to them uh, wherever you are. Thank you for making all of this happen. Um, and the this that's happening is one more round of queer of color, trans of color conversations. The series where we asked, what is it we wanna talk about? And we landed on, we wanna talk about what is queer of color and trans of color as a methodology? What does it mean? How does it show up in people's work? Who are the scholars out there trying to do this? And then what does doing this look like? Uh, and we sent that call out to like people whose work we really love and people who we respect and people who are friends and our colleagues and our aspirations. Um, and man, they all said yes. And they all agreed to come and sit down and talk with us. And tonight is absolutely no exception. Um, I love this one because last year we got to end with Nick Flores, which felt like ending with family, uh, the friends I had coming in here. This one is like ending on the friends I made along the way. Uh, Jose is just such a joy. And I'm so excited to share with you these thoughts. But first, I should do a little introing. Uh, and in order to get here, of course, I had to close all of my other intro work. So give me 10 seconds. Because Jose de la Garza Valenzuela is an assistant professor in the Department of Latino Latina Studies at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Focusing on fiction by gay Chicano writers, his current research investigates the legal underpinnings of queer migrant narrative to shed light on experiences of migration and residence in the U.S. inaccessible through the state's legal archive. More broadly, his interdisciplinary research and teaching focuses on Latinx literature, relational migration, and histories of legality with careful attention to questions of ethnicity, race, sexuality, and citizenship. Dr. De La Garza Valenzuela's work has appeared in Latino Studies, Malis, American Literary History. His work has been recognized by the National Association for Chicano and Chicana Studies, the Modern Language Association's GLQ Caucus, the Queer Trans Caucus of the American Studies Association, and the American Council of Learned Societies. He's currently a work on a monogram, tenet monograph tentatively titled Queer in a Legal Sense, Brown Citizenship and Other Lawful Fictions. Uh, Dr. De La Garza Valenzuela received his PhD in English with a concentration in women's gender and sexuality studies from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. After receiving degrees in English, economics, and international business from Sam, Mus Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas. After completing his doctoral training, he was a chancellor's postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Latino Latina Studies at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and then assistant professor of Latina Latinx Literatures at Florida Atlantic University. He's designed and taught graduate and undergraduate classes on Latinx literature, comparative Latinx migrations, queer writers of color, citizenship and narrative, and U.S. social movements in the late 20th and early 21st centuries, born in Durango, Mexico. Uh, 
Dr. De La Garza Valenzuela's work as a researcher, teacher, and mentor is informed by his own experiences as a migrant. Growing up undocumented in Houston, his early interest in the relationship between fiction and the law grew out of reading and translating immigration documents for his family and later undergoing the naturalization process himself. He's a first-generation college graduate. <sighs> Jose, that was a lot. I know. Thanks for Are putting you ready? me out there. <laughs> Thank you so much, James. Happy to do it. Floor is all yours. Thank you. No, I am very excited to be here. And I first want to thank James, Laura, and Matt for putting this together and also for all the folks at CLAGS who make this possible. Uh, I've been following the queer and trans of color conversations myself. And I think that um, they're just such a generative kind of like space for thought and also to just unpack a lot of stuff that we don't get to do in pound paper. And so what I want to do is kind of dovetail off of that like uh, extensive beautiful intro into like how we kind of like pull in, right? Where do we pull from in order to actually think about what, what queer of color critique might be, right? Um, as I've kind of put together my book, um, uh, one of the questions that kind of is on the background is like, well, like what's the difference between theorizing and critiquing, right? And I think to some degree that kind of is a something that is specifically a question that is targeted at queers of color, right? Who do, don't seem to particularly fit into, right? The kinds of like legacies of queer theory itself. And so I started off with that particular point of departure. And I think, Part of it is that it's not a hypothetical for us, right? Queerness is not necessarily a hypothetical. Racism, right? Homophobia, all those things are kind of like not necessarily some things that we just theorize about or, you know, kind of like think out loud. Um, we actually like reflect on them. We think about policies, about actionable movements that we can actually um, affect in order to change, right? The dynamics, right? That kind of land us in disenfranchisement. And so, I want to kind of speak a little bit about what my research is and what it isn't, right? And I'll kind of like ground myself with a little bit of writing just in order to not ramble. But um, I'll describe it uh, briefly by saying it came out of, right, um, having to go through the process myself. And I'm trying to think about self as methodology, right? What happens when we think about the interpretations of ourselves, right? And we tool them in order to kind of cast a different um, image of who we are. And I think that that's where literature kind of gains its kind of value, right? Um, and so... I conduct my research on citizenship, sexuality, and migration in the archival vacuum produced by the legal infrastructure that criminalize migration and queerness. My work puts the fictions upon which the historical criminalization of queers and migrants rests. And this is a big thing in what I'm trying to do, right? That the law never quite addresses us, right? It kind of just presents this kind of image of us that becomes actionable through police, through immigration services. And all of a sudden it affects a reality that is not actually there. Um, and so it's in dialogue with fiction by and about queers and migrants attempting to remediate these archival gaps to make evident the narrative economies in which a queer migrant legal subjectivity, what I theorize in my work as brown citizenship, takes shape. So my question 20 years ago, right, you know, when I started this, like not when I started this process, but when I started thinking really about the legality of my family and myself, right, um, is when are we documentable? When do people care to document my family's story, my story? Um, the question rested on the demand for public recognition that anchors so much immigrant advocacy and the presumably legitimating powers of citizenship. As a researcher, I have turned to representations that seek to archive the gap between the story the state cares to document and the experiences migrant and queer communities, sometimes one and the same, struggle to textually evidence without risk of identification as criminal. So basically, like my work is kind of like based on like, where do we actually tell our stories? How do we tell them without actually risking, right? Um, our own kind of like livelihood at times, right? But also our own kind of legal kind of presence. Um, queer in a legal sense and argues that extra legal interpretations of the law are of civic and legal consequence by opening up a legal archive previously unattended to in the field of Chicanx studies. What I want to do in my work and what I'm doing in it is like basically thinking about what keeps us right from actually reaching to laws that don't explicitly address us, but can be applied to us within the court system. And so in a sense, I'm thinking about the transfer of law. What happens when laws that criminalize queerness have applications beyond just queer people, right? Um, and the law, and I think the courts and the state will find ways to find the application, right, of these laws against queer migrants. Um, let me see, let me move through this a little bit. Let me give you a sense of kind of what I catalog in my book project. More specifically, queer in a legal sense interrogates the fictions that hold together these legal narratives, right? Um, with the aim to make evident the experiences of intra and international queer migration at the peripheries of citizenship. I offer analyses of works by queer Chicano writers like John Recce's City of Night, Arturo Islas' The Rain God, Michael Navas' The Death of Friends, Rigoberto Gonzalez's Crossing Vines, and 
time of Cortes's sexile exilio that allow us to reconsider the lawful fictions enforced through institutional narratives of queer and migrant life. They tell us something the law isn't telling us, um, I guess is my proposition. Reading these novels respectively alongside legal texts, like there's this tract from the 50s in Florida called Homosexuality and Citizenship in Florida, actually from the 60s. But it's um, it's kind of this kind of catalog of like, um, who are queer people, right? Like the state actually seeking to define people and share it in actual like pamphlets. Um, Boutillier versus INS, Bowers v. Hardwick, um, and a resident alien cards, Immigration Reform and Control Act in the matter of Alfonso versus Toboso, which was the first precedent for trans um, asylum seeking in the United States. I examine the gaps between the law's conception of the citizen, right, who can count, who doesn't, and how queer migrants at Chicanx has experienced and reconceive of the citizen in fiction. To do so, uh, the book project breaks with traditional methodologies used in the study of literature and the law that in literary studies often lean on the legal to contextualize a historical reading or the or text. So in a sense, I'm not thinking about like the law as just a context for these novels, right? But like the actual law, like the text of the law as itself, right? An object of fiction that we get to actually study, right? As literary critics, we're, we're, we're uniquely poised, I would say, to really kind of like break down what the law is trying to do um, in constructing us other than who we are. Um, while I offer close readings of novels and legal texts, together they are at odds with both the conventions of literary criticism um, in the same ways that uh, critical race theorists, Derek Bell and Richard Delgado, people who I invoke in my work, um, invoke histories of fabulation and legal scenarios and theorizing narrative and counter narrative uh, cuts against the grain of legal scholarship and practice. And so just to summarize, right, what, what am I trying to ask here is um, that an inflection point when the meaning of citizenship is as fragile as the institutions that confer it, Queer in a legal sense is asking whether we may understand each other in civic uh, relation beyond the ways we constitute our claims to and pursuits of legal citizenship in the United States. That is, instead of relating to, a, to, our, to each other as citizen or not citizen and determining what access we have to each other by virtue of that question, are there other kinds of mechanisms when we take a step back from the legal that allow us to actually see each other more fully? And the, and the chapters that I have, like the, fact, the chapters I've described, I assemble and relationally analyze a corpus of legal and literary text to critically interrogate the, institu the institutionalized fallacies that compel us to understand ourselves as citizen almost exclusively at each other's expense, recognizing the material realities that make pathways to legal residency and citizen appear to be the only means to address and redress the history of migrant disenfranchisement in the US, the book invites us, and I invite us, to consider how citizenship instead forecloses the kinds of coalitional possibilities that can make citizenship the kind of tool that we need it to be. Um, and so in a sense, right, I feel like what I'm asking is like, what happens when we are not legally, right, at each other's expense? Um, and I and I think that it, having gone through the immigration process, have, I think that that's basically it. Like we are the contingency, right, on which other people's claims to citizenship might depend. And that I think is kind of the queer question for citizenship, right? How do we, right, kind of engage with the arrival of the queer citizen, right, so to speak, or the gay citizen, right? Um, but also, right, just kind of think about the expense at which it has actually kind of come to fruition. So I'll stop there and I'll, you know, turn back so we can have a conversation. Oh, okay, man. I <laughs> thank you. I have. I'm gonna leave with the question I'll forget first if I don't ask it. Is the queer citizen the gay citizen? You know, and that's I think, and I think that's a good question, right? Like, is like what like what are the rubrics that we use to determine these kinds of categories? And I think this is a question that I received about the work too, right? That it's like, well, you're looking at gay Chicano writers, right? But you're talking about queer people, right? And you're talking about citizenship in this broader sense. And I think part of what I'm trying to drive at is like homosexuality and gayness has been used as a rubric to really understand and critique so many subjectivities within the law, right? And so to just say like, well, let's, let's take a look, right? At like this kind of like history, right? Of, um, of uh, let's say other kinds of subjectivities, right? Like trans subjects, for example, right? It's like if the law couldn't even address name, right? Homosexuality beside just describing certain acts they imagine we engage in, right? Like. I think that in part, right, we can't really like we can't really say like to write about gay law is just about homosexuals, right? It is actually right to like the rubric by which we've actually kind of engaged a conversation of queerness for 60, 70 years, right? And so in a sense, I think that that question is like what opens up, right? This kind of idea of like, what's the value and utility of citizenship at this point, right? To be citizen is not to actually, right? Um, 
like to be citizen is not to actually have citizenship exclusively, right? We don't, we're not citizen just because we have citizenship, so to speak. And so I wonder if the queers just kind of like, I wonder if, I let me, let me take that question in a sense, like, I think as we've consolidated this homosexual citizen, right, we've kind of realized that homosexual citizenship is not exactly attending to the questions of queer citizenship, right? Oh man, that was so dizzyingly good that I'm just gonna take a second and invite the room to have questions and to throw them into the Q&A if you have them, um, because we love to hear them. I also think on the live stream, you can send us questions there, whatever way you want to. Um, you know, I, I've i been kicking around like the question that is the through line question, which is like, in what way does queer of color, trans of color criticism show up in your work? And I invite you to answer it, although I wonder if you haven't already. Um, and so I will invite you to answer it as I also sort of sit with like, what is the thing I actually want from that question? Yeah. No, and I, I think that that is a, a unique question because I think we always go to the standard genealogies, right? I think that like we all remember our first encounters with like the theorists or the kind of critics that like put us on that track. And I'll just speak to like my own kind of a, uh, like the the origin story, so to speak, from my point of entry um, to queer of color critique. I remember before I could even articulate my own kind of like homosexuality, right? Like, or queerness or whatever I was calling it at that time. Right, this is like in the early 2000s. I remember like my faculty, the faculty around me had seen it, right? They were giving me, I remember a professor, um, I was like, oh, I wanna study like ethnicity and like um, Latinx literature. And she, bless her heart, right? Uh, very kindly, right? Gave me a copy of um, Hunger of Memory by Richard Rodriguez, right? And so like the conservative ed education essayist, right? And when I went to another professor, right? And both of these professors were white, white people, right? Um, he's like, oh, no, 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 no. It's like, and he hands me, right, and says, Shari Moragas, um, like, um, the last generation, right, and says, you have to go read Queer Aztlan, right, this is kind of like an essay that might actually be a better starting point um, than, than perhaps Richard Rodriguez, and at that point, right, you know, I went and read both, right, and then I started realizing they were clocking me, right? It, they were like, oh my God, little gay, like this is kind of what you need to be reading, right? And so like in a sense, right, I think in part, right, when we think about like um, what constitutes, right, what, how does it show up in my work? I'm like, it shows up like in the sense I'm like, some of us don't know, right, how to articulate our sexuality in an academic setting without that, right? In fact, we started reading those things before. And so in a sense, I think about queer color work is like we evidence each other, right? And we have to kind of like drag those kinds of like people. For me, those people might be, right, like Juana Maria Rodriguez, right? Queer Latinidad kind of shook up, right? The way that I thought I was going to be doing literature. Um, I think Jose Esteban Munoz, right? His kind of catalog, like kind of made, give me a sense of like, okay, well, how do we do this? But as a Chicano studies person, I was always like, well, wait, right? <laughs> like, it's like a lot of these people that are being kind of held as a theorist, right? Like the next theorists of our time, right? Are also like kind of speaking to things that are related to, right? What I do, but also like national and kind of like transnational traditions that are kind of different. And so, I turn to like Chicano studies more specifically, right? And then I arrive, right? at kind of works like Michael Hames Garcia, right? Like Ricky Rodriguez, who kind of are speaking to like cultural critique and like excavating, right? Like those kinds of uh, objects that we kind of assume are not there. And so I think I invoke all that genealogy to kind of like think about those gaps too, right? It's like, okay, if the law's not speaking to us, right? Then I'm like, then that's where queer of color critique shows up. We're speaking to us, right? And so in a sense, I think that, um, it's both right in like who you cite, but also in like the approach that you take to citing people, or like how you're trying to, who you're trying to make evident, right, in that particular genealogy. Um, and I think a particular, a great example for those of you looking for, right, it might be like the, um, there's an introduction to Gay Latino Studies, right, published in 2011, right, um, that I think kind of says like, okay, hey, let's reorient this, right, actually, like, what ha what would it mean for us to think about ourselves as also, right, grounded in like, scholars beyond, right, that the next studies, and so that's where we kind of bring in, right, the Ali Lords or Roderick Ferguson's that kind of have so much to say to, I think, like, concerns, right, um, in our field, too. Uh, okay, 
that was a comprehensive and beautiful answer and I'll take it. Um, you know, I respond to questions like it's not an interview or an exam. So uh, <laughs> I will always take it. Um, I guess I'm, I'm, I, I love this project a lot and I'm fascinated by this project a lot and like have been sort of following the pieces of it. And I think what I find so fascinating about it, and I think maybe what I find so challenging to me, and I think what I'm interested to hear you speak to is like oftentimes in literary criticism, because the object of analysis is literary, the mm -hmm. the place where the intervention seems to want to happen is at the level of the literary in some way, right? Like it's a call to produce better art or to think more critically about the way we art. I wonder with this project, which is both an intervention into the literary and an intervention into the legal, like what is it you want to see as the way this thing moves around the world? You know, that that's such a like good question because I feel like it, it's pushing me to think about the capacity of the project, right? In ways that I think when we're it's a first book, right? We're so humble about what it can and can't do. Um I think that partly what I want is my kind of gesture is to think about myself as the interpreter, right? And it, like having not been the interpreter in so much of like the ways that I've arrived at citizenship, right? And so um for those of you who have gone through like um, the process to get a green card, right? Like you, I remember, like for me at least, right? It was going right to um, to the city and like a Ciudad, going to the Ciudad Juarez, right, where the consulate was, um, and just kind of like presenting all this doc, all these documents, presenting my family's archive, basically, which I hadn't seen, but the like lawyer had requested, right? And so, in a certain way, right, what happens is that I start realizing so many right realities and truths about my family that were so not known to me, right? And so, for instance, I learned. And I'm putting this out there on the internet, so. <laughs> but I think, um, like, I learned that, like, my dad, right, had been married before, and that's how he had actually gotten his, like, green card. And that's exactly how I was actually now being sponsored, right, to actually become, like, a resident. And so um, so you kind of see all of that, the story literally being, like, um, leveraged against you, right, in order to catch you, right, in some kind of misnarrative, right? And so I think to some degree, like, that that is kind of what leads me to I think this part like I want us to think about like well what if I interpret that process like how do I right and maybe this is the pettiest and most vengeful kind of way I went and got a PhD and I'm writing a book right just trying to talk back to that particular process that sought to interpret me in the first place and so um so I think that in a sense right what I try to do is turn that script and I think that this also is at play with the corpus that I'm working with and 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 I think in a sense what I try to do is like well like Chicano writers are talking to migration, right? Even though some of them are not really speaking to migrate or non-migrants themselves, right? And so their parents might be, right? Their ancestors might be, but to some degree, like their understanding is at a distance. I thought about like, well, how interesting. Like, I want to turn the migrant, right? On Chicano literature, right? And what if the what if the immigrant is actually analyzing, right? These these particular renditions of migration, right? Like that itself can be like an intervention, right? And so ideally, Right. What I would like to think of as a kind of like, um, I don't know, collateral damage, right, so to speak, of the project is like, I think that the idea of putting people in the driver's seat of the of actionable interpretations that might be of consequence for them, because I think that we consistently, as especially as migrants, uh, especially those of us who came here undocumented, that we just don't have any actionable voice, right, because we are not citizens. And so I'm like, no, there. I, I remember the community built, right, between undocumented families, right, in the apartment complex when I was a young kid. I'm like, that's civic life, right? A civic life that's denied on paper. And so to some degree, I'm like, where do we see it articulated? Whether it's like, you know, I, because I focus on literature, I turn to novels, right? But then I turn it to like, for instance, like it, it might be like saying, find the literary in a, in a newspaper, right? A local kind of archive that kind of, you know, captures, right? Anything from like, you know, people selling cars to, you know, like uh, personal ads to the short poem, right? That randomly appears to fill up space, right? And so I think that, what I'm trying to do is maybe not elevate, right, you know, like fiction to the reality of the law, right, but to actually, right, kind of like, like bring, right, level, right, the kind of differences and in, in kind of um, and terrain that we see between the legal and the literary. The legal is also founded in these fictions. What have we studied as such, right? Um, and so, in a sense, I just kind of want to poke at that, at, at that, at that logic, right, that what the law says, in fact. Is based on, on reflects a reality. It's like no, it it creates one, right? That then we get to engage with whether it's like an academic work or literary work, you know. I will do that thing where I'm leaving space for other people to ask questions. Um, 
because I oh we maybe have a a, a hand from our ED Matt. <laughs> You know, you just, yeah, so I, first of all, I don't know if people can put questions in the Q&A, and so um, we, I might just change the setting so they can put it in chat either way, so I, I don't know, um, but uh, Jose, you, you started to answer this question, uh, I, I just, you know, I am a thinker that is, is like, I just need concrete examples of things, <laughs> and so when you, you, your opening remarks, you talked about um, what civic relations allow us to understand uh, understand ourselves not as citizens mm -hmm. or not through legal citizenship, and yet there's still civic relations, right? And so I was just wondering, and the, and so you just gave a couple, um, but but I was wondering which ones you touch on, if if you want to just sort of drill down into one or two of those those kinds. Right. So I like so one of my um one of my chapters, for instance, the one on the Arturo says it's the rain god. Um, kind of speaks to like how people try to pursue their own kind of like uh dis like how to, how they try to kind of narrow down the distance they have to the citizen right to being to to that claim to citizenship and so for instance in the in the novel right we have like uh it's being told primarily through this like narrator right who is related right we come to learn throughout the series of two books uh to like the to this guy right named Miguel Grande right and the author is his son or is his son. Um, but he, uh, Miguel Grande is a policeman, right? He's a cop. And so all of a sudden, right, the ways that he's trying to approximate citizenship, right, is by running for office, right, for running for sheriff, doing those kinds of things, right? And all of a sudden, right, everybody else's life, right, and everybody else's story, everybody else's crises have to be put on pause in service of that claim to citizenship, right? And so, like, we have this kind of hard idea, this kind of sense of, like, this is, like, citizenship, right? The thing that I get, the naturalization certificate, the kind of object that allows me to vote right um however right i think that what i'm thinking about civic relations is the alternative right to that it's like there are ways in which we create community we we actually like create local change right in legal ways right that are not necessarily legally allowed right and this is kind of where i think uh to kind of answer uh, or attend to this question is like i think that what i'm trying to do is harden the difference right the separation between the legal and the lawful right i think that like the legal right what's granted what's written in, in, in the text of the law right allows us to say like oh i am this i have citizenship i have a green card right but i think that there are unspoken things that are allowed that will allow us to create community in ways that does have a civic impact right and so whether that is like protesting right whether that is like even like you know um, create like uh, a hashtag, right? Creating literally like particular forms of civic engagement that don't require citizenship to have actionable um, results, so to speak, right? Um, and I think about this and not in relation, not that like the end goal should be, right? A kind of policy change or whatever, like the policy, I think for instance, citizenship will always exclude someone, right? But I think that we can stay, take a step back from that and say like, well, what if we all think about ourselves as migrants? And this is kind of the move that the book makes, right? So when we think about, let's say, states like Florida, right? Um, uh, so, like, which I left right before, it kind of like got really nasty um, around questions of like kind of a DEI, around questions of LGBTQ forces. I'm like, I think that they harden borders, like to, to cross that border from, right, another state into Florida, right, means something different, right? And so what I want to do is reorient this question of like citizenship being the category that we use, right, to kind of uh, relate to each other when we can actually think about ourselves as intra and international migrants, right, as a kind of different way to relate. Um, What happens when the person can't leave a state, right, because the state forbids you from leaving to procure particular kinds of like, let's say uh, reproductive services, right? Uh, that becomes a question of migration, but it doesn't require transnational kind of borders, right? Um, I think in Texas, for instance, like what happens if this kind of like Senate bill passes, right? And they can now just kind of pursue anybody, right? I think that people will organize civically, right? To kind of counter a particular, hopefully, to counter a particular definition of what the citizen looks like in Texas, right? And so, um, and just to fill in, I think like, I think it's us before, right? Basically, like they, um, they create the possibility for like cops to, without any kind of consequence, right, really interrogate, right, people based like their citizenship or like to ask them for their papers based on how they look, right? There's a lot of immunity, right, embedded into that bill. And so I think that that changes, right, the way that citizenship kind of has, um, the power citizenship has. And so just to like more concretely speak to that, it's like, I think of the moment, right? Um, and this is a story that I think a lot of like migrant families have, right? 
what happens to the moment when somebody arrives, right? From like, let's say in my family's case from Mexico, right? And then you say like, well, you need a job, right? And you're gonna be asked for a green card. It's not like the government office that gives you that, right? It's a word of mouth networks, right? That create a civic possibility, right? That the state is trying to foreclose, right? And so all of a sudden, you know who sells the kind of counterfeit green card. You know where to go get a counterfeit like ID, right? Things like that, that make, right? Livelihood possible. Um, in ways that I think are civic, right? Even though they might not be legal. I'm I'm so, what's the, I'm gonna ask it the dumb way that's coming to my mind first, which yeah. is, can you talk to me about the archive and the principle of selection? Cause I, maybe this is just my own insecurity speaking. How do you pick the things? I guess what I'm asking is, do you start with the legal principle you're trying to unpack and then find the text that best illustrates it? Do you start with the text you find most interesting and then think through the sort of like citizenship implications therein? Like what is it, what, what is that relationality? Like, you know, that I think in part, right? Um... It depends on the text, right? And so I remember, for instance, there's another chapter, right, that I wrote uh, on Diego Huerta Gonzalez's Crossing Vines. The first edition of that was just about literacies, right? And saying like, oh, like in that chapter, basically the conceit of the book is that, or the novel is that um, this character is being asked to write an ethnography, basically this family, right? Or like do some kind of ethnic studies project like that. And all of a sudden his methods start echoing right? the kind of like methods by which we actually like apply for naturalization and apply for green cards. It's like, let me get your, your fingerprints. Let me get your photos. Let me, where's your birth certificate? Like all of a sudden, right? We become the people who send these kids out, right? To actually, right? Ask their parents for their papers, right? And, and that becomes something that I think uh, problematic in, in, the, in the novel, that becomes so so interesting. And so in part, I think a, a moment like that, right, just kind of goes like, oh, like it is the ask, right? What, where, where does, where is that situated, right? Like is the ask actually the legal gesture or who authorizes, right? And I think that to some degree I move toward that, like what are the authorizing kind of discourses, right? That allow one people to like, to have that model of research that that's the way that I think the state and state universities even, right? Might actually get to know, right? about migrant communities. Um, but I think also I'm very, for me, like starting this project was just, I read the introduction to um, Entry Denied by uh, Lewip Hyde. And it was just like a catalog, right? Of just immigration law. And I was like, oh my goodness, let me read this. And I did that. I went back and started like, let's just start with like the Page Act. Let's start with the, these. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, they're, they're inheriting these discourses and language. And so I got to, for instance, like um, 1917, there's an Immigration Act where all of a sudden literacy, right, like having to know English, having to know about civics, right, becomes a requirement at the same time, right, that like um, we start seeing, right, restrictions around sexuality, right? And so even though the changes around literacy, like the, 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 the requirements around literacy change, right, the test changes, the mechanism by which we conduct a change, like we had psychopathic personalities literally linger for like, 30 years, right, before it actually went away. And so I think in part, what I what I what I look for are those moments. It's like, oh, what metaphors kind of persist, right? What kind of like particular form, like what what catch-all categories kind of like are echoed, right, across a particular um kind of a legal kind of like a trajectory. In terms of the literature, I think in Chicanex studies, right? Um there's the corpus is only so deep, right? And so I think part of what happened was I'm like, okay, like if I want to write, I remember thinking like have maybe like enough writers to have two books on good Chicano writers, right? But then I was like, well, like if I want to have five chapters and that that really cannibalizes into a second book. And so I think what I tried to do is look at their legal histories, right? Um, in a sense, like going back to that Rain God chapter, I think uh he's talking about his family coming from Mexico. And I'm like, okay, well, I know exactly the conversation in the 90s and the 2000s, but what was it about the 1940s? What did that look like? What was the ease, right, uh, with which people just moved, right? Um, um, and and that just kind of led me to that historical interrogation that I think, right, I retooled to say like, no, no, these are just these are just documents that are telling a story that I have a book that is it's telling that story differently, right? Um, City of Night, right, by John Retchie. It's like at the same time that we're saying like, y'all can't have oral sex, y'all, you can't be sodom, all this stuff, right? It's like, 
like literally here is a book that's showing us all the oral sex that's happening, right? You know, like we're speaking to or alluding to all this kind of salacious stuff. And so in a sense, I'm like, well, how do we remediate that coexistence, right? Like, so it, just because it's not in the legal text doesn't mean that there isn't a kind of legal question that we can mobilize against. And in a sense, I guess, and I'm sorry, I'm just talking a lot now because I'm working, I'm really working on this introduction as we speak. <laughs> it's like, I think I'm trying to figure out, right? It's like, if the state can mobilize around these fictions, right? Why can't we, right? Why can't we mobilize against the fictions that we author, right? In order to achieve these particular political goals, right? Well, now I'm thinking about your intro too. <laughs> I, uh... No idea, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> I I have so many questions that I think the only way forward is to switch gears entirely. Uh, so let's switch gears entirely. Talk to me about teaching. Because this is all really interesting. And I wonder, like, how effectively it shows up in the classroom. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think about the classroom as, like, as this kind of space where I think we get to reinvent what it what it is, right? Especially as queer faculty, right? Queer faculty of color. I don't think that we arrive at a classroom necessarily understanding what it's supposed to do for us because a lot of us arrive at it with very vexed relationships to education. And so I don't think specifically, right? I think as a as a as a migrant, right, and as a person who grew up largely documented and moving in and out of the United States, I'm like, no, we're consistently learning about the world that we occupy, right? Um, but we don't know, we're, we don't feel authorized to speak to those worlds, right, in, in the classroom setting. And so I think this goes back a little bit to your question about um, how, like, about, like, how do you approach, like, what are the stakes of literary study here? I think that I'm lucky to be in a, an ethnic studies department, right, where I think there's a lot of flexibility in terms of kind of like what literary, like, there's not a formalist down the hallway, right, just kind of like telling me that that's not literary work, right? Um, what I see uh, is- Ah, you lucky bastard. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> and so in a sense, right, what I do have, right, is a lot of students who are telling me like the different kinds of work that literature does for them, right? And I think that that's kind of been very important for me, right? I think um, when we talk, and, and I do invoke, right, like my kind of research in the classroom in a way that speaks to, for instance, like, okay, so what happens when you go, right, to like, let's say the university office to try to change your name, right? Um, and they're like, no, the story that we get to tell about you is this, right? like you don't get to make that decision, right? And so like all of a sudden students get start getting a sense of like, oh, like it's not just this theoretical, this is what I opened with, it's not a theoretical kind of question. It's not a hypothesis about what would happen to me if I went to the office to change my name. It literally is, right, an experience, right? That we get to really retool narratively because we read the ways that people navigate those kinds of erasures and absences. And so um, I think like for my students, they like, let me see, what book, they've really loved Carmen Maria Machado's like, um, in the dream house, they're obsessed. I am getting a little, I've taught it for three semesters. I'm not getting sick of teaching it, I like it. I'm just like, okay, like this is just, I need to like get a little bit of a variety, right? Um, but they are obsessed with like the idea of telling the legal story in different ways, right? That it's like, oh, like the law is a genre. It's like, girl, yes, right? It's like, it is a convention, right? It does have its own aesthetic kind of rules and like, um, it's an aesthetic kind of like drivers, right? And so like to some degree, I'm like, absolutely. What That's a perfect example of what, what happens when we as interpreters, right? Kind of put ourselves in that kind of like um, at the wheel, right? It's like, what if we are actually like presenting the law, right? In these ways that like they might feel misrepresented. It's like, no, the law allows, right? For certain kinds of abuses, for certain kinds of disenfranchisements. And if you tell a judge that, they'd be like, no, absolutely not, right? The law is actually telling you what's right or not. And so, um, but I think that oftentimes it's about that. It's, I think, in the classroom about it, especially queer students, right? Like, um, to say, like, okay, like, you don't see yourself in the classroom, neither did I, right? So what do you do, right? What story can we tell each other in the confines of the space, right? Uh, what complicities can we build here, so to speak? This is making me think backwards to something you said earlier that I was thinking about, which is, I was just intrigued because like, I don't know, I because instinctively I want to push back, but I don't have pushback, which is to say I'm intrigued by your sense that the corpus of Chicano literature feels limited um, or like, you know, like there's there's a handful of texts that are the texts. And I and I am instinctively drawn to like, that can't be true. But then I find myself trying to push back and I'm. 
it's like, I think like gay Chicano literature specifically, right? I, I think that there's a deep bench, right? Of Chicano writers, the Chicano authors, right? And like, there's a history. I don't want to like um, be on the record saying like that there isn't. But what I will say, right, is that there is there are politics to publication that certainly right limit, right? What access we have had to works like John Ritchie's, for instance. And so, um, and I think like in my first chapter, for instance, I speak to something like that. It's like, you know what, like instead of tending to a law that engages with migration, I want to tend to a law that engages with the movement of texts, right? What happens when we can't circulate an actual legal text? And so there's, for instance, this uh, legal case, right? Um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm, what is it? A uh, manual versus uh, some post office guy, um, uh, the US Postal Service. They were basically saying like, you can't actually like, um, mail these like kind of like muscle magazines right because to some degree right they're gay content right and so of course like uh they go to court right and what we realized is we as, as i started looking through like some of those magazines right was that like actually they were also advertising literature right that's where you saw right some of the like ads for john Ritchie's novels early novels that's where you saw some uh, like like um um, advertisements that were trying to basically like um, create an actual literary audience, right? Like a queer literary audience, a national one. And so I think in part, right, it's like, I think I'm trying to say like, there's certain kinds of issues that I think queer writers, right? And gay writers had to face, right? In the last eight years that allow us, that, that create this kind of smaller corpus, right? I'm sure, right? Like I, I don't consider myself like a kind of like, I'm not going and digging for authors that are out there. There are people who are, right? Um, but I think that like my book is not a recovery project yet, right? And I think that in a sense, I want to say like, what's out there? Let's kind of actually pedal it, see what's going on because they merit that kind of treatment. Um, but I will say, yeah, just, you're right. It's like, there is there is a deep bench, right? So to speak, of Chicano writers, like the next writers, but I do think that what I wanted to do, right, is consolidate, right? As many kind of queer Chicano writers and offer a kind of history, right? Of why we don't actually have those kinds of like, people collect it together often um, through this book. And I think it is in the law, it's grounded in, right? Not only like who's able to write, who's able to circulate their work, but also, right, um, like who feels authorized to actually tell a story about how they belong, right? And and I think that that might be the kind of key to that unlocks my corpus, where it's like, no, I think that all of these people are turning the personal into a narrative, right? That can only be circulated as fiction because the stakes are so high. Right. Um, when you actually say it, this is my story, it's like, well, no, it's like if it's a story slightly removed from me, right, like then the implications can be about it, not about me, so to speak. I mean, that kind of answers the thing I was going to ask, which is like just that. I mean, I'm following forward and I'm thinking like that I didn't want to put in your mouth the words that the corpus is limited, but rather like what I was thinking was that maybe this is a called to think about the other ways in which narrative circulates, right? That given the sort of complicated publication history and the way in which like, we know these are not necessarily artists who are gonna be able to work in the novel form. Are there other places that make sense to be looking for the kinds of circulations of these narratives? Like it, yeah. in, in AFAM Lit, right? It's always periodical culture is the answer, right? Like it, if you can't find it in magazines or in books, you can find it in like magazines because that's where most of that publishing is happening uh, because it's so difficult to get novels out while black in America. Uh, oh, yeah. And so I'm wondering if there's something similar here. You know, I think I think you know what I what I've been starting to do as I'm looking for future projects too is trying to do. I have this idea of a historiography of like literary criticism and Latinx studies, right? You know, to think about kind of like, well, let's kind of like who was talking about these people already? Like, because I feel like you know, as I started reading, I'm like, wait, we've been talking about gay Chicano writers since like 19. 80, 1970. I'm like, why is this, why does this always feel new? Why does it feel new in the 90s and the 2000s, right? Even now, it's like, oh, it's so, in, like, it's not innovative. People, y'all are just not listening. <laughs> and so there's that question. Um, but I think there's also a sense, I've been looking at these, like, collections that emerged, right, from, like, the student, um, from student writers. And so our, our counterpoint to that, right, might actually be in Chicano studies, like, um, because of, because of our history with establishing kind of like a Chicano and ethnic studies departments is like the kind of like um circuit like a um, tracks right the kind of like self-published stuff that was coming out of like these emerging departments and programs and so like there's like really amazing work happening in my department for instance we're celebrating we're like 25 heading on to 30 years since the founding of our department like there are stacks right of like publications newsletters things like that right that like literally like 
collect so much. And part of my interest is like, okay, so no one's putting like, this is a gay writer next to them, right? We're not kind of like signaling all these people. We're not outing them in the table of contents, but at the same time, right? It's like, I refuse to believe that I can look through 10, 12, 15 volumes of like Voices of Aslan, which is like, you know, like this like old kind of like anthology and not find one, right? It's like, like, we have to like, so to some degree, it, it's not going to be just about like where we turn, but how we read for people, right? And and I think that that's kind of the promise of ethnic studies right now. I think of like critical fabulation and the kind of richness, right? Of being able to say like, you know what? I get to be a speaker, right? In this particular history, that's not there, right? Like let's kind of look at those archives and kind of remediate, right? Those and triangulate them with others, right? But I think for me, it would be interesting to look at a study of like, yeah, like student authors, right? Um, and look and look at those particular kinds of uh, like print, like the emerging print culture of the like sixties and seventies. That would be really cool. That sounds very cool. I support this project. Uh, but first, <laughs> finish this one because this one is also very cool. Um, I'm gonna make the smallest amount of space for anyone else who would like to answer, ask a question. Obviously, you'll do the answer. Uh, because if no one has any questions, I always just love to end on, you know, <sighs> what are you reading? What am I reading? No, that's a good, I will say a quick plug. I think I'm, I'm, I'm revising, like I said, my book and I'm looking at this chapter on sex oil. I'm reading like, um, I'm reading Sex Oil by Jaime Cortez, Abel de la Vasquez. So I'm like turning to the two books that touch on it recently published, um, my mentor, Julia Avril Minnick, um, her book, Radical Health, right, just came out really good. And also Puta Life, right? She has a whole chapter on Adela Vasquez and like the kind of history of her public, like how the public history of people archiving, right? Her narrative and like kind of her kind of cool interest in, in kind of um, putting it out there, right? And so I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reading that. Um, and I'm also starting to read a lot about, I'm trying to like also like uh, get a project off the ground, right? Um, on uh, this figure in Chicago, Damo de Pudos. Like he was, uh, he and his uh, partner kind of like famously established um, uh, International Mr. Leather. They established like all these like kind of uh, interesting, the circuit, right? The gay circuit in Chicago emerges kind of like largely around their kind of activism. But at the same time, his archive is split between, right? Um, let's see, uh, the Leather Archives in Chicago, but also the Newberry Library, right? And so like, I'm trying to figure out like what's where, right? And like why why you would take someone's like really like corpus and split it, right? Um, and so I'm reading a lot, I'm following up a lot on him um, right now. So that's kind of a, what's it play now? I didn't plan it and you couldn't have planned it better because the next thing that I'm going to say is an invitation to the things we're doing next year. Uh, and one of the things that we're doing next year, my co-chair, Laura Westengard, is leading up a new series on the power of leather, uh, which is going to be an exploration of all the ways in which leather shows up in queer community. I'll put you in touch with Laura. I, I think you do my own chat. Um, <laughs> We've arrived at the end of a year's and some change worth of just deeply brilliant people that I'm going to force to come back and talk to you some more. Um, I, I'm i so thrilled that we got to do this. I've loved every second of doing it. I appreciate all of you for your time, for your participating. So before you go, a couple quick notes. When you head to bookshop.org, backslash shop backslash clags i know that uh you can find our bookshop page and it is a collection of all the things from our queer of color trans of color participants all the things that they've written all the things that they want you to read we are building a list and we want you to buy your books there because when you do you get to support bookshop and they're a great organization you also get to support clags and that's very cool uh, so keep an eye on the bookshop page I think James froze. <laughs> um, is our new series, The Power of Leather, wherein we are going to be talking through leather and leather communities. Uh, the other one of which is our queer globalization series, uh, headed by the aforementioned Margot Weiss. Uh, it's going to be great. And I'm so excited for you to join us at CLAGS for all the programming we have upcoming. Uh, you can donate at CLAGS.org. Uh, you can join us and participate in the other big thing we're doing, which is the Munoz Award. Man, so many things. I probably should have led with the Munoz Award. Uh, Alok Vaid Menon is this year's Munoz Awardee. Am I supposed to say that yet? I worry that I'm not. 
you'll find that out next week if you weren't supposed to. I'm so excited that maybe this is a, a preview. I should stop here. This has been great. And I love all of you. Thank you for your time.